Hi. <laughs> okay, I forgot to press record. Okay, it's recording right now. Well, as a little boy, I grew up in a small apartment in New York City. I didn't have a lot of exposure to a lot of animals except for pigeons and squirrels that were going to parks. Wow. Um, I loved, there was a show on every Sunday night. It was called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And it was such an incredible show for me where it showed wildlife from all around the world. And at that moment, I knew that I wanted to work with animals. Wow. At first, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian because I said, well, if I love animals, I'm going to want to work with, with animals and be their doctor, right, to make them better. Unfortunately, chemistry was not my strongest subject. Oh. <laughs> so I, knew I, knew I had to come up with plan B. And I realized that I wanted to be a naturalist. I wanted to study wildlife. I knew that I had to work outdoors with animals, that I didn't, I wouldn't do well if I had to be in a suit and tie in an office every day. So yeah. I knew I wanted to work outdoors and, and working with wildlife enabled me the opportunity maybe of also traveling, seeing different places around the world. So that's what I knew that I wanted to do. I, I focused my studies on the life sciences. I was very good in biology and the life sciences, just chemistry gave me a hard time. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I realized that to get my foot in the door, I, I studied zoology at the University of Florida. And to get my foot in the door, I knew that I wanted to work with animals hands on. And zoos really afforded me that opportunity. You know, without having to travel to Africa, I could work with things like lions, yeah. and, and, you know, elephants and things like that. So I applied for a zookeeper job. Uh, that was over 42 years ago now oh, wow. um, as a zookeeper and just kind of worked my way up. And, you know, through my entire life, I, I started with reptiles. I started working actually as a, at a place down here in Miami called the Miami Serpentarium, where I just focused on venomous snakes, cobras, rattlesnakes, crocodiles, a lot of a lot of reptiles. And I got a lot of hands on experience working there. Didn't make a lot of money. But one of the things I learned very early on is that experience is is one of the most important things you can have. You know, it's, it's certainly important to get your education, get your degrees, but we'll, what will set you above the rest is the experience that you have, the opportunity yeah. to get that hands-on experience. So though it wasn't a lot of pay, I did get a tremendous amount of value by working with those animals, opened the door, they got me the job as a zookeeper at the old Cranon Park Zoo here, and I gradually moved my way up. I became a lead keeper, I became a senior zookeeper, I became a zoological supervisor, I became an assistant wow. curator. And now I'm kind of a spokesperson, uh, you know, kind of the spokesperson for the zoo where I do all kinds of things, working with all kinds of animals, traveling around the world. I do a lot of television documentaries, working with uh, with wildlife. I've been, you know, Africa, uh, the Amazon, Galapagos, amazing. Antarctica. So it's been a really wonderful career for me. Wow. Oh, awesome. OK, I'm sure you, you are inspiring them right now. <laughs> So first question is from Lily, and she's asking, what is Mr. McGill's favorite animal and why? It's a very good question. You know, it's a very hard question to answer. It's like almost asking a parent, what's your favorite child? Right. <laughs> the, the, the answer I, I normally would give is the last animal I was working with, because all animals have their incredibly fascinating traits that make them very interesting to me. But having said that, if I had to pick one animal, an animal that I've done a tremendous amount of work with is a bird called the harpy eagle. Wow. A powerful bird of prey in the world. Anybody, you know, a lot of people are familiar, for instance, with the bald eagle, which is the national mm -hmm. United States. Yeah. Beautiful, big, majestic bird. Well, if you put a bald eagle next to a harpy eagle, it would look almost like a pigeon. The harpy eagle is half again the size of a bald eagle. Talons bigger than my hands. Wow fly at 50 miles an hour and take a full grown, grown sloth out of the canopy of the forest. It's a beautiful crest on it. It's a very majestic, very beautiful bird. And it's a bird that I've done a lot of work with in the tropical forests of Central and South America. So the bird itself is beautiful. The habitat that it lives in, the tropical American forests are just stunning, gorgeous forests. So if I had to pick one animal, that would be my favorite. Wow, awesome, Interest, interesting. Okay, so next question is from Jonathan. Jonathan asks, do apes and humans have the same DNA? They don't have the exact same DNA, but for instance, the bonobo, the pygmy chimpanzee, is believed to have the closest DNA to ours, close to 99% yeah. identical human uh, DNA. So they're nice. very closely related to us. The pygmy chimpanzees and the chimpanzees are the apes that are the most closely related to us. Awesome. Okay, so Evan has a few questions for you, a few questions for you. How does a mommy kangaroo carry such a big baby for so long? Okay, that's the first question. <laughs> Generally speaking, you know, kangaroos 
are marsupials. So they're what they're called non-placental mammals. So when they give birth, they give birth to a baby that's tiny. Uh, a full-grown kangaroo will give birth to a baby that's the size of a jelly bean. And that jelly bean kind of slowly crawls into the pouch. And in the pouch, there are two nipples that are that attaches to one of them. And it continues to develop in the pouch. It's almost like a uterus for that animal. It's like a mommy's belly, you see, where it continues right. to develop in there. And it gets larger and larger. Now, in the wild, it usually will get out of the pouch by the time it's five or six months old. And slowly but surely be pushed out. Under human care, in zoos, you will see many times the kangaroo joeys, which the baby's called, will stay in the pouch much longer. Why? Because in zoos, they're being catered to. You know, they get their food given to them. They don't have to run away from predators. They don't have to look for water. It's a very kind of comfortable lifestyle for them. So there's no pressure to get the baby out. The baby is allowed to stay a little bit longer. You know, I kind of equate it to the fact of sometimes when kids grow up in a human household, they go to college, they get their degree, they get a job, and they still live in the house. Sometimes the parents have to say, hey, you know what? It's time to move out. Yeah. It's time to move out. <laughs> If, if, if they have it very comfortable, it's a very big house and there's not a lot of pressure on the parents, they might let them live there a little bit longer. It's yeah. the same with the animals, the kangaroos. Under human care, the babies will sometimes stay in the pouches much longer than they, than they would in the wild. But in the wild, by the time they're seven or eight months, they're usually out of the pouch. Okay. Okay, next one. What do sloths eat and how long do sloths stay with their parents? Okay, well, sloths are basically herbivores. So they're vegetarians. They feed basically on fruits and vegetables and leaves. Some sloths focus almost totally on leaves, like the three-toed sloth tends to eat the cercropia leaf. That's its favorite type of leaf. They have a very slow metabolism. The mother will stay, uh, the baby will stay with the mother sometimes for up to a year. Um, mm -hmm. So they stay clean to their mom. You know, sloths are very fascinating animals. The slowest moving land mammal yeah. move only about six feet a minute but they're very good swimmers okay so people think of the sloth as being this long-legged animal that moves very slowly but the fact is they're very good swimmers where i worked with a lot of sloths in panama i've actually seen sloths swim across the panama canal oh really the neat thing about sloths is this is that you know sloths are arboreal they spend their entire life, life practically up in the tree yeah. the only time they come down from the tree is to either get to another tree that they can't reach in the canopy but more likely than not, when they come down from the tree, it's to go to the bathroom, which they only do about once every week or once every two weeks. And they'll come down from the tree, they go to the bathroom, and they go right back up. The reason why those sloths don't come, from the, come down from the tree often is because they're slow, slow moving and they can be predated on by animals like jaguars, you know, big snakes. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, those yeah. types of animals. Yeah, awesome. That's interesting. I didn't know, I didn't know that they could swim. Oh, they're good swimmers. <laughs> That's yes, interesting. Can. Okay, next. What animals do not stay with their parents after they are born? Well, there's some animals that never even see their parents. For instance, many reptiles, you know, sea turtles will lay their eggs and leave them alone, as will many snakes and lizards. They lay their eggs and they leave them alone. They don't incubate the eggs or anything. The eggs hatch, they never see their parents. Turtles. Uh, uh, yes, turtles, uh, lizards, yeah. snakes. Those reptiles many times do not see their parents. Um, there are some birds that are called precocial. In other words, when they hatch out, they're kind of much eating solid foods on their own, like ducklings. Okay, you'll see them following their moms. They do yeah. stay with their mother, though, for several weeks. Birds tend to stay with their parents for a shorter more amount of time than mammals because birds have to fly and be on their own very quickly. Um, mammals, generally speaking, tend to stay with their parents. I don't know of any mammal that the minute it's born is on its own. Okay. Mm. All mammals need some type of care. One of the things that distinguishes mammals is that they produce milk, you see. So they have to breastfeed their babies. So that's why all mammals tend to always need to stay with their parents for a certain amount of time. Some much longer than others. You know, some mammals may stay with their parents only a few weeks, where others may stay with them for several years. Yeah. Okay. Remy asks, I would like to ask how many types of birds has he photographed and why does Fossa eat lemurs? Ah, well, first of all, I probably photographed thousands of different birds. Yeah, I, I saw your I saw your website. 
all around the world from Antarctica to Africa to the Arctic to, you know, the Amazon. So it's thousands and thousands of birds. As far as why fossas eat lemurs, it's because they all live on Madagascar. So Madagascar has a limited amount of food there and fossas are really the only true predators and they're very tenacious predators. Um, so they will feed on anything that they can catch. They are carnivores. So as carnivores, they have to eat meat. And lemurs are one of the abundant, well, when I say abundant, a lot of meat lemur species are endangered, as is the fossa, yeah. because they live on a small you know, on Madagascar. But you know, lemurs are, are a type of prey that the fossa will take. And being a very aggressive predator, they are successful in taking lemurs quite often. Interesting. OK, next, why do some baby birds have just a teen, teensy tiny bit of feathers, or some have no feathers when they're born? Ah. Good question. There are two different types of birds. There's the precocial birds, which are the ones like the ducks and some of the uh, the waterfowl that when they hatch out, they have that nice down on them. Chickens are another example, okay? Yeah. They hatch out immediately and they have that beautiful little furry down on them and they're walking. They're following their parents and they're immediately eating, you see? Their parents don't feed them. Then there's the other type of bird that you see in the nests that are often when they hatch out, they're Totally, their eyes are closed. They're just a little bit of maybe a strand or two of feathers, and they're very pink yeah. skin all around them. Those are birds that are incredibly dependent on their parents, and they are not precocial. They, they stay in the nest, and they have to be fed by their parents very carefully. The first several weeks of their lives are very, very dangerous for them because that's when they're subjected to all kinds of predation. Um, right. So those are the two basic types of birds. You have the birds that stay in the nest that have hardly any feathers when they hatch out of the eggs. And then you have the ones that as soon as they hatch out of the eggs, they're walking around and following their parents. Yeah. OK, next. Uh, Ella asks, do you know why toucans or toucans are colorful? Yes. Toucans have that very large beak that has a lot of colors on it, right? But if you were to hold the, the skull of a toucan, it's very light. It's not a powerful beak at all, but it has a lot of color in it. And the reason for this is that, the reason for that is this, is that toucans live in the rainforest, okay, tropical forest, and they tend to live in the canopy. If you're in the canopy of a rainforest, it's very thick, very green, you see. By having those bright colors, they can basically announce their presence. They move their bill up and down, and those bright yellows and reds, they stand out against the greens of the forest so they can communicate with each other. They move their heads up and down, and those bright colors stand out, and that's how they can find each other and communicate with each other in the dense forest green canopy. Wow. Okay. Um... Okay, now it's my turn to ask questions. I have a few questions for you. <laughs> we have a few minutes left. Have you written any books? I have not. I've not really written books. I've done books, not in general publication. I've had uh, self-published books on my travels to Antarctica, to the Amazon, to Africa, you know, to to different parts of the world um, that I that I've published mainly on my photography. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. What is the last thing you're hoping to accomplish in your life? Oh, geez. You know, I guess the last big thing on my bucket list is to go to Australia. Oh. I have been to Australia and that would make all seven continents for me. And as a boy who grew up in a small apartment in New York City from immigrant parents who, you know, had very little formal education, uh, I would consider that a huge accomplishment to have set foot on each continent on this wonderful planet. Wow. Oh. Okay, next, uh, I have two more questions for you. <laughs> what are some, what are some endangered, oh, I can't speak. What are some endangered animals you are taking care of right now? Well, we have so many of them here at the zoo. We have, you know, Sumatran tigers. There's only believed to be less than 500 of them left in the wild. Um, we had a cub born last year. We just had a baby Adax born, uh, which is a desert dwelling antelope of which there's believed to be less than 300 in the wild. So, you know, we have uh, Komodo dragons here. We have giant river otters. Um, I, I get to, uh, you know, work with these animals 
on and off throughout the year, depending on what we're doing. Uh, most of the time I'm observing them, I'm photographing them, I'm trying to tell stories about them, but it's been very fortunate for me that I get to work with these animals and I get to work with a lot of the animals in the wild too. You know, I travel to work with the harpy eagle in Panama, work with the cheetah in South Africa, work with the sloth bear in India. So I've been able to travel around the world and work with a variety of those animals also. Wow. Okay. Last question. I know you're doing your best to conserve white wildlife. When you rescue these animals, do you plan on putting them back in the wild and what is being done so they won't have to live in zoos for the rest of their lives? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I say, and this might sound strange coming from me because I've worked in a zoo for 42 years, but the bottom line is this, in a perfect world, we would never need any zoos because everyone would have the opportunity to go see an elephant right. walk in the Serengeti or go to the Galapagos to see a tortoise or you know, India to see a tiger. Unfortunately, we don't. So zoos play a very important role in providing windows into that world for children especially. I do what I do today because as a small boy, I went to the Bronx Zoo in New York. And when I saw these animals in real life face to face, there was a connection that was made there that inspired me to do what I do today. And I'm very proud to say I've raised millions of dollars to help animals in the wild where they belong. When we do rescue an animal, our goal is to release it to the wild. Mm. That is the ultimate goal. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes an animal has experienced an injury that makes it impossible right. for it to survive on its own in the wild. But the ultimate goal is to get it into the wild. On the flip side, I don't ever support taking an animal out of the wild simply to put it on a zoo exhibit. Uh, the only time I would ever support taking an animal out of the wild and putting it on a zoo habitat is to save that individual's life or it's a last ditch effort to save the species. And zoos have been able to do that with several species, whether it be the California condor, the black-footed ferret, the Arabian oryx. These are all species of animals that would be extinct today had it not been for zoos maintaining them under human care and maintaining a viable population. So in closing, you know, we do everything we can to get an animal back to the wild if we're rescuing it from the wild. Unfortunately, sometimes it's impossible to get it back to the wild because it would not be able to survive due to whatever injury it sustained. Those animals become ambassador animals to hopefully inspire other people to care about those animals in the wild. But the bottom line is this. If the zoo is the last place that we can see these animals, then zoos have failed at what should be their number one priority. And that is to ensure that animals can always live in the wild where they belong. Wow. Okay, Ron, it's it's been so fun. I appreciate you meeting me today. I hope we can meet again soon. I would have loved to chat more, but I know you're busy. So oh, but I, it. I have <laughs> new students in my animal class next month, so I'd love to do this again with you. I'd love to do it. That would be my pleasure. Where are you based at? I am I right now I live in Georgia in the US. Oh, cool. All right. Well, great. I look forward to connecting with you. Just send me an email. I'll be happy to do it again. Hopefully oh, that's the awesome. Situation will be better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Have, have a great day. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.